Hello, everybody, and welcome back to BioSC140 Human Physiology. This is going to be the part three video of the blood lecture. So, mature red blood cells lack a nucleus. They are a nucleate. They don't have a nucleus. They are sacs of hemoglobin. Now, in order for a cell to divide and replicate as most cells do, you need to have cellular machinery. You need to have your nucleus and all the cellular machinery and organelles that a typical cell would have. But red blood cells don't have this. Mature red blood cells don't have this. And you should know where mature red blood cells come from. They come from dot, 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 pluripotent hematopoietic stem cells. If you didn't remember that, please review our last video. So let's look at some other characteristics of erythrocytes. So they are flexible. In lab, one of my favorite labs or favorite parts of the lab that we do when we meet in person is we take a goldfish and we anesthetize the goldfish so that it's asleep, it's still alive, but it's asleep. And we put its tail underneath a microscope and we can actually see the blood flowing through the arteries and veins of that goldfish. It's incredible to see. But one thing you'll notice is that red blood cells, I mean, they're 40% of blood by volume. Or, you know, we talked about that you know, in the previous videos. They can vary. But there's a lot of red blood cells in your blood, and they are bouncing back and forth. They're bouncing off each other. They're bouncing off the sides of the artery or vein, they're flexible. They're always bumping into things. Also, another thing you'll notice when we watch these videos or look at it underneath the microscope is that the capillaries are incredibly thin. They're wide enough for one red cell to slip through and it's a tight fit. So it's really good, it's really important that these erythrocytes are able to twist and squeeze through capillaries and that they have this, this classic biconcave shape. No nucleus, no organelles, no mitochondria, no ER, a nucleate, they are sacs of hemoglobin. Now, an immature reps, uh, red blood cell, so this is in between the pluripotent and mitopoietic stem cell and the mature red blood cell, this classic image that we all know, they're called reticulocytes. That's a vocab word. I have asked questions on reticulocytes in the past, and students quite often overlook this vocab word. So I'm pointing it out to you because it's a common thing that people miss. Reticulocyte is an immature red blood cell that still has a nucleus. There is clinical importance to knowing that word you might come across this word when working in healthcare. So that's why I'm stressing this. All right, so red blood cells have a characteristic shape. I bet you if I showed you a picture of a red blood cell before this class even started, you still knew like, like what, it looked, what it looked like. Like I'd show you the picture and ask, what is this? And you could say, oh, that's a red blood cell. And it's got this characteristic shape that we call a biconcave shape. It's kind of like a donut, but there's not a complete hole in the middle. It just gets more narrow. And what this does is it increases the surface area. What was the name of the law where we talked about flux? Fick's law, all the way back in lecture exam one material. And we talked about how increasing the surface area will increase the rate of flux. Well, that's what this biconcave shape does. It helps facilitate diffusion by increasing surface area. Hemoglobin is the main component of red blood cells. Red blood cells are sacs of hemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin must be a pretty important molecule if you know, red blood cells are just you know, basically just sacs of hemoglobin. So absolutely, hemoglobin is a very important molecule. So there's about 280 million hemoglobin molecules in every red blood cell. 
I want you to know that number, 280 million hemoglobin molecules per red blood cell. It's an incredible amount. About 14 grams per deciliter, about 5 million red blood cells per microliter, and about 5 million microliters per human. I want you to know these two numbers also. Uh, you will come across these numbers in laboratory also when we do the red blood cell lab, so be prepared. Hemoglobin, when people think about hemoglobin, people think about red blood cells, they think about them like the general public, they think about it as a, an oxygen carrier, and that's exactly what it does. But it's not its only job. Um, it can actually act as a buffer also to help stabilize pH. But the main thing, the thing that it's famous for is um, hemoglobin carries oxygen. So oxygen does not dissolve very well in aqueous solutions. And our blood is primarily, you know, it's an aqueous solution. And so really there's not a lot of oxygen that we're able to pack into our bloodstream. Not sufficient enough actually. So our bodies have this wonderful molecule, hemoglobin, which is able to increase the amount of oxygen that's held within our bloodstream. So it's an oxygen carrier. It allows us to put more oxygen into our bloodstream and move it around. So hemoglobin has a very uh, characteristic makeup. It's got its own shape. Remember, form and function is important. Hemoglobin is a tetramer. So tetra is four mers. It's got four main components. Four main components. It's got two alpha units and two beta subunits. Two alpha subunits, two beta subunits. One, two alpha, one, two beta subunits. Each sub subunit has a heme group. Heme groups are these blue circles in this picture. So four heme groups, one per subunit. Each heme group can bind to one oxygen. Each heme group can bind to one oxygen. So there's four heme groups. So how many oxygens can bind to one hemoglobin molecule? One, two, three, and four. Four. So four heme groups, four oxygens can bind to it. This is important. One heme group per subunit, one oxygen per heme, a total of four oxygens can bind per hemoglobin. Iron is a key component in hemoglobin. Iron in the heme group, so each one of these heme groups has a iron at its center. That iron must be obtained from our diet. And if we do not have enough iron in our diet, it will cause us to not be able to produce enough hemoglobin and we'll have a disease state. We'll have iron deficient anemia. So each one of these heme groups has an iron molecule, iron atom worked into it. That iron comes from our diet. If we do not have enough iron in our diet, enough iron absorbed into our bodies, We'll have anemia because we will not be able to produce enough heme groups. Iron is required for hemoglobin synthesis and function. Hemoglobin famously carries oxygen, but it can also carry other molecules. So hemoglobin up here, when heme is bound to oxygen, it's called oxyhemoglobin oxyhemoglobin. When it is not bound to oxygen, when it is not bound to oxygen, it is called deoxyhemoglobin. So 
Oxygen bound to hemoglobin tends to have a reddish color, that reddish blood color. When there is no O2 bound to it, it has more of a bluish color, cyanosis. Now, this is not a picture of somebody with cyanosis. This is a picture of somebody with face paint. It's a little extreme, but there will be a bluish hue to people's lips when uh, they have extreme, you know, when they start to get cyanosis, when there's not enough oxygen bound. Carbaminohemoglobin is when an amino acid is carried on the hemoglobin. Carboxyhemoglobin is when the hemoglobin is bound to a carbon monoxide. So this is a very important one to know. Carbon monoxide is a dangerous molecule. It's a byproduct of combustion. So when you burn wood, carbon monoxide is produced. When you burn gas, carbon monoxide is there. Carbon monoxide, so it's something that we encounter in our everyday lives. When you smoke a cigarette, it produces some carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide, you might have heard of it because in our, our homes in California are required to have carbon monoxide detectors. Our bodies cannot detect carbon monoxide. It's odorless, it's colorless, we can't see it, we can't, we can't see it, we can't smell it. We don't know it's there unless we have these carbon monoxide detectors in our homes which alert us to it. Carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin really, really tightly. It has a very high affinity for hemoglobin. So it binds onto it and it stays on. It occupies that binding location and does not allow O2 to bind to it. It competitively inhibits O2 and it can be deadly. It can be deadly. So a number of years ago, uh, my sister was living in Iowa and it made the news that this family from Iowa went down to Mexico and they were all found just dead in their Airbnb. And it turned out that there was a, a leak, a gas leak in the house and they all died of carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, I went to Mexico a year ago and I noticed that on all on Airbnb, when I was going through the website, it actually listed on each profile if there were carbon monoxide detectors. So it's, it's a big deal. It's, you got to know about carbon monoxide. All right, so hemoglobin components are recycled or secreted. Recycled or secreted. Old red blood cells are, re are removed by macrophages. So we've talked about red cell production. They come from pluripotent hematopoietic stem cells and they're produced at a certain rate. We've talked about how kind of briefly, they only live for 90 to 120 days. They live for three to four months, after which they need to be recycled. Those old red blood cells that are ready to be recycled are removed by macrophages. So we want to recycle all of the hemoglobin that we have uh, from these old, worn out red blood cells. Hemoglobin has some valuable components. We don't want it to go to waste. So first thing we do is we separate the heme component from the rest of the protein, the globin molecule. And all the amino acids from the globin uh, are gonna get, it's gonna get broken down into amino acids which are gonna be recycled. We don't wanna waste amino acids, proteins are, are valuable. We'll recycle all the amino acids that we can. The iron, we're gonna remove the iron from the heme molecule. And 
that also is going to be recycled. Then we're left with the heme molecule minus the iron. And this is going to get turned into a molecule called bilirubin, which is not, which is a waste product and it's not water soluble. So it's going to have to bind on to albumin and it's going to get transported to our liver where it's going to undergo something called conjugation. Conjugation is going to make it more water soluble and it's going to allow us to remove it from our, from our bodies. If there is a liver issue, or if there is an issue with the conjugation that prevents conjugation from happening, a conjugation defect, there's gonna be no secretion of it. And a buildup of this bilirubin is gonna cause something called jaundice. And it's gonna make the person, it's gonna make the patient appear a little more yellow, uh, usually in fingertips and eyes, it's gonna give them a yellowish hue. Now, why are there babies on here? Babies tend to have a higher rate of red cell death. They also have little baby livers that can't keep up always with this high rate of death. So jaundice, some jaundice in babies is, is fairly common. So I'm going to pause the video here and we'll finish up this set of lectures with part four. See you in the next video.